I'd like to thank everyone for being out this morning as our technology warms up. I'd like to let you know that I am pleased to have you join me in a study of God's Word. If there's anything that I might say or do that may be against God's Word, you'd be a friend and I'd be in a great debt to you if you were to point those things out to me. You know, some of the things that we see in the Scriptures as we look at uh, just a couple of these uh, scriptures that we have in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 that says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, able to rightly divide the word of truth. It also sees, we also see in Acts chapter 17 verse 11 that there, were, there was a group of people called the Bereans and they were more noble-minded in the fact that they searched the scriptures daily to see whether or not what was being presented to them was the truth. And they were searching the scriptures daily to see if the words of Paul were according to the scriptures or not. So you have the right and you have the responsibility to search the scriptures to see if there's anything that's being presented here in this congregation and even more specifically with me as I present these things. You do have the right and responsibility to do those things uh, for yourself. I'd like for you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, this will be our base text today in which we're going to build upon the sermon. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll start in verses 3. And it says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. I'd like to continue to think about this idea of pulling down strongholds or pulling down of fortresses. And as we kind of move through how powerful the Word is, I'd like for you to take a couple of notes, and that is the Scriptures reveal that the Gospel pulling down the strongholds of a hardened heart. If you will, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16 and verse 23. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, and that was the persecutors of the, of the preachers, they threw them into prison commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But right around midnight, all the disciples were praying. They were singing hymns and praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. Before you go any further, I want you to notice a couple of things. And that is, we're going to be talking about this jailer. And notice what he uh, had to do. He received such a command that he threw them into the innermost prison, the one that they absolutely could not escape out of. Then he bound them, chained them, whatever he had to do to make sure that these prisoners were not going anywhere. He had a very hardened heart in the fact that he didn't care what they said. He was out for himself. He was making sure that he was taking care of business and doing his job correctly. And then this earthquake happens. Nothing of his fault. And everyone's trains were unfastened. The doors were flung open. And notice what happens next. And when the jailer had been roused out of sleep, and he had seen the prison doors open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And I'm going to tell you today, had he fallen on that sword, he would have been given an answer for his sins without any kind of hope whatsoever. Even to this day, still paying for that. But what we see is that Paul screams out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself. We're all here. We haven't gone anywhere. And he called for lights and he rushed in <clears throat> and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas and after he brought them out, 
He said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Evidently, he was listening to some of the things that were being spoken, some of the things that maybe he had heard about these guys, and he knew they had an answer, and that is, what must I do to be saved? This shook him at his core. And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you shall be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord together with him, with all his house, and he took them at that very hour of the night. He washed their wounds and immediately he was baptized. He and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set before them food. And rejoiced greatly having believed in God with his whole household. Now, a couple of things I want you to notice is that he had a hardened heart. And once they started talking about this man, Lord Jesus, something happened. A change happened into him. And that is that that gospel penetrated that hard heart. And it didn't matter what his job was. We've gone from just keeping them fastened to the wall to bring them into my home and feeding them. That's the change that has happened. And that was because of what the gospel does. It pulls down the strongholds of a hardened heart. In Acts chapter 8, verses 21 through 24, we read of another example, and that is, <clears throat> excuse me, and that is of, of this uh, sorcerer that was, uh, that was in um, Samaria. And he sees what the apostles are able to do, and he wants part of that, and he offers this sum of money. And this is the example, or this is the statement that is given to him, and that is, you have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours, and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon the sorcerer answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourself so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. So we see that he kind of had a hard heart. We see that whenever it was pointed out to him where he was coming from and where his heart actually was, he didn't want to stay there. This gospel changed him. And we'll read a little later on about that whole, that whole city of Samaria. But we see that he had this hardened heart that was completely and totally dissolved and the fortress of that heart had been taken away or torn down. We also see in Acts chapter 2 verses 36 through 38. Acts chapter 2 verses 36 through 38. Peter says this to the crowd. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And here we have on the day of Pentecost, some of the, the, Jew, the Jews of Jews, they're there for a certain celebration, and something happens that gets their attention, and this is what's told to them. And we can see where it says, after we talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, what starts to happen? They were pierced to the heart. That gospel pierced through it. It tore down the fortress of their hardened hearts. So we see that the pulling down of strongholds, the Scripture reveals that the gospel is able to pull down the strongholds of a hardened heart. It's not the only stronghold it's able to pull down we also see that it's also able to pull down the stronghold of human wisdom. In 1 Kings chapter 5, verses 10 through 14, we're given this example of a man by the name of Naaman. And Naaman was a great general who had leprosy. And he came to this man by the name of Elisha, who was a, a man of God. And Elisha... He came, to, he came to Elisha wanting to know what to do to heal his leprosy. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go wash yourself in Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you'll be clean. Simple and easy done with. But Naaman was furious. 
and went out and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me, stand and call on the name of his God, and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. You see, his human wisdom said, this is how it ought to go down. The man's going to come out here, he's going to wave his arms around, he's going to call out to God, and then it's all of us. But that's not how it happened. And we see this idea, and I know that we've heard a lot of sermons on this, and that is, behold, I thought. Human wisdom. And then he makes this statement. Are not Abnar and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Then his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, had the prophet told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. Following God's pattern and following what God says transcends human wisdom. We also see something else. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and this idea Paul hits on very hard here. And I want to take some time in, in this. This is a kind of a long reading. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31. For the word of the cross, it is folly for those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Quoted from Isaiah. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews. Nonsense to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, it is the Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. We'll continue on in a second. I want you to notice a few things. In the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. You can search all you wish. It is only what God has revealed about Himself in what you have in your laps today is what you will understand about God. You can suppose, you can think, and you can feel. But what you have transcends all of that it does away with all of your human wisdom. It does away with what you think about God and how you feel about God. Instead, what it does is answers those questions that you have. We also see something else. You know, the Jews, they're wanting signs. And we know people today that all are wanting signs, they're wanting miracles, they're wanting all of these things. Just like the Jews did. The Jews demand signs, and the Greeks, the philosophers of the day, they're seeking wisdom. <laughs> but yet here we stand, and all we do is present a third option. And that is the gospel. And because of that, people consider it utter foolishness. It's not signs, it's not wonders, it's not anything great. Continuing on, it says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling. Think about this. For consider your calling, brothers. There's not many of you who are wise according to worldly standards. Look around you. Think about that. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. 
We don't have a lot of powerful people sitting amongst us. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not wanted, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts boast only in the Lord. Our wisdom, this preaching that we do, this gospel that was sent to us through Christ coming here on earth and all things being revealed, that is not of us. So we cannot boast about this. But yet, God has chosen us to present those things to people who consider themselves wise and powerful and all of the... We are the vessel in which He's chosen to proclaim it. We also see in Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 12, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men. Remember what we were talking about, about the human wisdom and where that leads. According to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ, for in Him... All the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in Him you have been made complete. And He is the head over all rule and authority. And in Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands in the removal of the body for the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with Him in baptism in which you were also raised up with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead. So we see something about human wisdom and the warning thereof. See to it that you're not taken captive by that. It is very easy for us in a world that continues to inundate us at a very young age about how we can be considered smart, wise, intelligent, whatever it is that you know your um, driver is. They're telling you something exactly different than what God wishes. And so it's important that you're not taken captive by that. You can only know the things of God that God reveals to us about Him. We also see in James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behaviors his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. In other words... Glad you have wisdom and understanding. But you have a responsibility with that. And the responsibility is you need to show by your good behavior gentleness. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. But it is earthly natural, demonic. For where je jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure. Then it is peaceable. It is gentle. It is reasonable. It is full of mercy and good fruits. It is unwavering. It is without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. It's important that we understand that all of this wisdom that comes down from above and what it looks like in contrast to the wisdom which is not from above. Don't be arrogant. Don't be, you know, thinking of yourself. So we see that there is a pulling down of the strongholds. The scripture reveals the gospel pulling down the strongholds of a hardened heart, human wisdom, and also a social position. In Acts chapter 17, it says this, And the brethren immediately, I'm in Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 12, And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, 
They went to the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. As a result, many of them therefore believed along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. Humbleness does something to people, and it brings the, them at an equal level with everyone else. And I've said before, the cross is the great equalizer of mankind. The cross does not care what race, nationality, gender, it doesn't care about any of that. What it cares about is are you willing to submit to God? And we see that even in these high social positions, along with these number of prominent Greek women men, and women and men were able to humble themselves to obey the exact same gospel that the poorest Jew was. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 19, 9 through 14, which we read earlier in our class, do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, you have put on the new self who is being renewed to a, new, to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, him a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, freeman, but Christ is all and in all. And so those who have been chosen of God holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And that bond of unity is where God wants us. And he says, you can take all of these people from any uh, race, nationality, any creed, it doesn't matter. All of them can come to unity. But you have to understand that it is your job who have been chosen of God, holy, love, you need to put on a heart of compassion. And we also see something else. Whenever it says... Excuse me. That we have been renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. And so we understand something about this also. And that is when we do these things, the compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whenever we do those things and we find unity, we show the image of God. And if you'll remember way back in Genesis chapter 1, whenever God created man, He said, let us make man in our image. And we also see something else. That whenever Christ came down here to, believe, to uh, show us, and it says, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love. That's what He showed also. He was the manifestation of the Word. The very words of Genesis chapter 1 were manifested through Him, and this is how He taught. We also see in Romans chapter 12, verses 15 and 16, Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. In other words, let go of your social rank and your social position, but instead associate with what you consider to be lowly. God sees it as equal. You have to start seeing things the way that God sees things. In James chapter 2, he gives a, an example here. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes in your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and you say, 
you sit here in a good place and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. In other words, social position means absolutely zero to God, and it should mean the exact same to us. And so we see that the scriptures do reveal that the gospel can pull down the strongholds of a hardened heart, human wisdom, social position, and also religious beliefs. In Acts chapter 6, verse 7, it says, And the word of God kept on spreading. And the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. Notice this. And a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. That gospel was able to penetrate even the priests. It tore down their religious beliefs. It made them melt away. We also see, as I said before, we're going to go back to Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, whenever we're talking about the city of Samaria, uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 13, and Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and he began, began proclaiming Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord were given attention to what was said by Philip, as they saw and as they heard and saw the signs that he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice. And many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was much rejoicing in that city. Now there was a certain man named Simon, who formerly was practicing magic in the city, and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from the smallest to the greatest, were given attention to him saying, this man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magical arts. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized. Men and women alike. And even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and the great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. So we have the city of Samaria that he goes down to. He pre preaches the gospel. They actually had someone who had been performing miracles for a very long time, or uh, uh, magical arts for a very long time. And then you put that up against miracles, and it looks pretty false then. But notice they didn't try to justify and say, well, my mom and daddy had always believed that. They didn't try to justify and say, well, I've done this all my life. They didn't try to justify any of this. They just believed what was in front of them and what was stated to them. When the gospel enters into good and honest hearts, this is the result. And it does not matter how grounded someone is in their religion. It can penetrate that. In Acts chapter 17, verses 2 through 6. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned from them from the Scriptures. Now, to understand what's happening here, Paul would always go to a city, he'd find the synagogue where the Jews were, and he would go in there, and he'd start asking questions. Now that takes an extreme amount of courage because you know what's about to happen, and that is there's going to be some opposition. He explained to them, giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with the great multitude of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. Now stop right there. I want you to notice these people who had these religious beliefs what have they decided to do? They are now persuaded. They are joining Paul and Silas. And they are taking along a great multitude of God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. Now that's what happens. But there's always opposition to that. But the Jews becoming jealous. 
and taken along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob, and they set the city in an uproar, and coming upon the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring him out to the people, and they did not find them. They began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. Now the gospel is able, it is very well able to break down religious beliefs. And I want to tell you something else. In our next point, we're going to talk a little bit more about one of these men mentioned here. We see that the scriptures reveal the gospel being pulled down, uh, pulling down the strongholds of a hardened heart, human wisdom, social position, religious beliefs, and also of church persecutors. And as you look back at what was happening there, they were trying to squash what was going on in the church. And what we see is in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, it says, And I also say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. And we always have in our minds that the, that the church is just barely hanging on. What has happened is for 2,000 years the church still exists and the uh, gates of Hades still have not overpowered it. And that is the principle and that is the absolute law that is being given to us when it comes to the church. We see in Acts chapter 26 verses 9 through 11 one of these persecutors who is actually going to the synagogues to reason with them by the name of Paul. He says this about himself. So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I look up many of the saints in prison, lock up many saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them, often in the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. Here he was saying, I was in the synagogue for a different reason. And that was to persecute the church. And now you see the difference that has happened, that he is now the one going into these synagogues to preach the gospel. What a change. But that's what happens whenever church persecutors run, inside, run into absolute truth strongholds start to fall in Galatians chapter 1 he goes on to say this about himself for you have heard of my former life of a manner of life in Judaism how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and I tried to destroy it and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries along my countrymen being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. That's who he was. And we can really look at his pedigree whenever he makes this, this statement about him being um, going beyond, advancing beyond his contemporaries and his own countrymen. He was extremely zealous for that. Notice where he comes to, though. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 16, Paul writes this to the young evangelist Timothy. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because He considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, and yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in my unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. And yet, for this reason, I found mercy. In order that in me, the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate His perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in Him for eternal life. 
what a powerful statement he says of look at where I was. A blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent aggressor trying to stamp out God's work. And he could have gotten rid of me, but he chose to put me in his service. He says here, I was one way, and now I'm something completely different. And in between is Christ. So we see the scriptures reveal the gospel pointing down strongholds of a hardened heart, human wisdom, social position, religious beliefs, church persecutors. You don't need all the fluff and everything else that is given to the world today. What you need is to understand that you cannot underestimate the power of the gospel. As we look, I ask the question, is every thought of yours captive? Do you believe? In Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, we were told, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved is condemned. We also see that we are told to repent. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, what we read earlier, and Peter said to them, Repent and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We also see that we need to confess. In Acts chapter 8, verses 37 through 38, this is immediately following Philip after he leaves, uh, leaves the city of Samaria. It says, And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he, that is the eunuch, answered and said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. We also see that one needs to be baptized. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, we are told, and corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of of Jesus Christ. And lastly, we see that you need to live faithfully. In Romans chapter 11 and verse 22, this stern warning is given. Behold then the kindness and the severity of God to those who fail, severity. But to you, God's kindness, if you continue in His kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And so as we look at back at our sermon, I want you to Think about Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 and 17. And that is, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And the question I want to pose to you is, have you had your in-between moment? Have you had that moment that you can say, I am different and I am forever changed? Like if you think about these things as we stand to sing the song that's been selected.